<laughs> I run into my own music all the time. I, I watch more YouTube and Twitch than anything else, and it never fails to make me laugh out loud. I, even during the most inappropriate times, I'll be watching something, somebody's being all heartfelt, and all of a sudden, I start playing piano in the background, and I'm like, oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Hydrated Gamers Podcast. For our guest today, you've probably heard his music before. In fact, for the past year or so, I've been using a song that he custom made solely for me at the end of every single video. Thanks again for that song, I really appreciate it. And you've also maybe heard his music in many different films. In fact, over 150 different short films and long films have his music. It's none other than the musician himself, Chris Zabriskie. Chris, thanks again for joining me today on today's okay. podcast. And I just got to ask you up front, how did you start making music in the first place? I'm sure maybe oh, yeah. a parent of yours or a friend introduced you to making music, but tell us the, the humble beginnings and a quick introduction from your end would be great. How did I start making music? Um, I kind of, I taught myself piano when I was about 11. Uh, I had seen The Sting, Robert Redford, Paul Newman, George Roy Hill, right? One of my favorite movies. I had seen The Sting, it had blown me away. I was very interested in film, but uh, I have all the Scott Joplin music in uh, The Sting got me wanting to play piano. So I, I just taught myself to play piano. And I was also learning video editing at the time, primitive VHS tape video editing. And so music and film have always kind of been together for me. And yeah, started really writing songs seriously in high school, recording stuff. I got an eight track cassette tape, you know, recorder up there still. And uh, just started making albums, <laughs> making records. I have a good few dozen albums that no one has ever heard and no one ever will <laughs> sitting in. <laughs> in storage and yeah just kind of never stopped with some pr brief breaks but yeah i just sort of got into it taught myself a little guitar taught myself some drums and eventually got into electronic music production in the late 2000s and that's what really led me into making ambient music quit quit like singing i was more singer songwriter sad sack white guy kind of stuff <laughs> before that and i just I've hopefully buried all of that where no one can find it. <laughs> well, it, it's so cool because you've been making music and with the 18 albums, I, I did count actually uh, this weekend. It's 18 right now. 18 yeah, that right are available yes that's so incredible and you know if you look at spotify i i'm, I'm sorry i'm a spotify user i don't use apple yeah, music me too. there we go no, there I'm we go guy. like to yeah. hear it you have over fifty thousand people listening monthly uh, on spotify you have over I know. twenty thousand. you have over twenty thousand subscribers on youtube i'm a bit jealous mm -hmm. not gonna lie um but well it, that's been over a long time and that's been a little meme fueled back in the day but you know it's the yeah, no, I, I don't know. I don't do a lot of promotion or advertising. I just sort of put out art. And after a good 15 years, there's actually people listening. And I'm actually making a living doing this, which is bizarre. So but it's, it's still it's still all very new and weird to me. I'm like, I don't understand why anybody likes my music, but whatever. I think I'll this making it. it's a great segue actually over because you, you even said yourself, hey, I'm not really promoting my music all the time. Uh, if we kind of dive a little bit deeper into maybe how most people heard your kind of music, a lot of it is actually through content creators or just other people using your music in their own, um, either it's films or YouTube videos. In fact, I'll, I'll tell you a quick story real quick. So I used to watch a, a, a friend of mine now, but back in the day, he wasn't a friend. I was just watching him on YouTube. He goes by the name V Third Eye. His name's Jason. And I watched a lot of his vlogs on, on YouTube. This was 2014, 2015 or so. And he always used a couple of song tracks. And after the third or fourth time, of me listening uh, to the, the music that he used in his vlogs. I stumbled up across, it was you. He always credits you in the description. And I think a lot of different people. Um, a lot of people don't do that. <laughs> Even though it's the only thing I ask, a lot of people don't do that. It's always uh, nice. But it's 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 always good when, when people do do that. That's like a great promotion with you. And shout out to Jason. Like, and now he's a good friend of mine. And he's always said, he, he I just spoke with him today. I was like, hey, I'm, I'm going to be talking to Chris today. He goes, I spent countless nights editing YouTube videos, humming his tunes while I'm editing yeah. it and putting in his music. So I wanted to ask you, you allow a lot of different people outside uh, who are making uh, content to use your music. 
what is that process like? Why did you decide to make it so freely to be used? Are there things that you've given up or regret doing as a musician in order to make sure that people can use your music? Uh, yeah, there, it comes with occupational hazards for sure. Uh, I feel like uh, once a year somebody steals all of my stuff, gives it different titles, and uploads it to Spotify, and they get mad, and I have to DMCA some stuff, and I, I hate doing that kind of stuff. But um, I got into it because I have never wanted to make money with music. And the fact that I am is still kind of weird to me and I'm still getting used to it. Um, years and years later, I it was always supposed to be free. And I've made a, a ton of records with a ton of people and it was always supposed to be not for the money. To, to remove money from the artistic equation entirely and just do what I want to do and not let that guide my decision making. And so I was really big into torrents. I mean, Napster changed my life in college, right? I was in college when Kid A came out and I downloaded that a few weeks early on Napster. And that experience was like totally mind melting, not just the record, but the how I got my hands on the record. But then three weeks later, I went over to Circuit City and bought it on CD. You know what I mean? I'd never thought I was stealing anything. I It was just an, a, the only way to find music. There's no music streaming and there's like, there was the only way to find new music. So I was big into file sharing and torrents and private trackers and stuff for a long time just to find music. Now you can do that so much easier on Spotify and YouTube. But uh, it was always about the sharing. And uh, I uploaded my first ambient record to a private tracker. I remember it must have been Oink or what.cd or one of those. And um, that instantly spread in, like, in a weird way just through that uh, little community. And... Um, then in 2011 though like i i i'm just i would get ugh. the music's instrumental i'm a movie guy anyway you can probably tell some movie posters or whatever i'm a i love movies and uh so yeah i guess the stuff's cinematic but i never made it thinking that people would actually use it as a soundtrack to anything but immediately a very good friend of mine who lives in bushwick his name's french sonic we've been making movies and music videos together since high school and he immediately was like, I'm making movies for your I'm going to make a movie for your soundtrack. I'm going to make a short film for that song sort of thing. And I was like, oh, really? You put this in a movie? I just think this is like weird droney noise stuff or whatever. Uh, and that stuff just spread. So I was getting a million emails of like, can I use this? Can I use this? Can I use this? Can I use this? It's like, of yes, of course. Like, I'm tired of saying yes. So Creative Commons became a way to like make that a little more visible and official. And... Uh, let people know yes i share this openly just give me credit that's all it means this is the only tattoo i have is the creative commons attribution oh, logo. cool and i just i like to share i want people to to listen more than i want money or anything like that so um that creative commons became an incredible way to let people know that they can use my stuff and they don't have to contact me it's it's all cool you don't have to let me know <laughs> You're welcome to, but I takes you know, I don't answer emails very frequently, so it's like it, it's it, very uh it, it, hands off for me, but still lets it share. But that is the only way that anyone's really ever discovered my music. It's been it's been a slow process of YouTube video here, YouTube video there, and then it gets into the I don't know. We're I, I think last time I, I it's hard to get the stats on YouTube, but we're we're well over a, a billion uh plays on so on social media, on Spotify and TikTok, and I mean, not Spotify, YouTube and TikTok and that kind of stuff, just being in the background of people's videos. Mm -hmm. So even yep. when they don't give me credit, I get a lot of YouTube comments and emails from people going like, oh, thank God, after three years, I finally found this song. I heard this in a video about woodworking and he didn't say who the music was and I finally <laughs> found it in another video. And, and I love that though too, because now it's like, okay, now you're never gonna forget my name. Like yeah. you, you will always remember my name and I've had those experiences with other music too. So it just works out for me. It's, it's turned out to be a really amazing way to kind of let the music spread organically and I sure. don't have to but, you know, buy advertisements. I don't have to, hey, listen to my quiet music, you know, yell at people. <laughs> it just sort of happens in the right places and people do other cool creative art with it. And it's like, it's, it's the perfect place for me. So it's it's really been amazing. I, I think it's so cool because I'm, you know, I've listened to, I'm a big person to have YouTube 
videos on my second monitor while I'm working oh. or doing other things. I think a lot of people nowadays, they do that. And, you know, sometimes I'll hear videos with like over 500,000 views or a million views. And they're very recent, like two months old, three months old. I'm like, here's Chris's music, like appearing in the middle of it. And I'm just so awesome that you allow people to do it. And most of them that I've seen, I check like, do they credit him in the description kind of thing? Most of them, they'll do that either in a list of like how many, most people, I'd say a majority uh, do, but to even to those who don't like, that's still people who are in the comment section looking for your, your music. And it's just so cool. Some artists, they do allow for people to use uh, their music. Hey, you can use my music, but a lot of musicians, they'll, they'll stop at the, oh, if you're monetizing your videos, then, then it's not okay. They draw the line there. And I think it's so great that you just allow people to use it for whatever kind of purposes. Just put my, main, my name in the description. You're good to go kind of thing. And I think yeah. that's, that's awesome. And I, I just wanted to kind of tell a quick story in, in regards to my music career. I know you, you might think I'm a, you know, a big rapper <laughs> or, you know, what did I create back in the day? Well, SoundCloud rapper? Yeah, here we go. I'm about to drop it right now, guys. Free All exposure. Right. No, no, no. So my music, when I was uh, in fifth grade, I actually played the alto saxophone. My dad liked to okay. listen to jazz music in his office. So I was intrigued to try playing the saxophone. About a couple years later, I picked out the baritone saxophone, which is a pretty okay. beefy instrument for my small gamer arms kind of thing. So that, <laughs> that was very, very fun to try and play. Uh, and eventually I made, made it up to marching band in high school, like freshman year of high school. Marching with the baritone? Marching. Well, I ended up switching back to the alto saxophone. <laughs> too big. Too big oh, for me to march okay, I with. Gonna say, I was going to say. Oh, no way. Ambitious. No way. I got photos to prove it. So, you know, if, maybe I'll show some photos on screen right here. But um, when it came time to, you know, pursuing more band, I, I wanted to try theater out. And you only have so many electives when you're in high school. So I, I told my band teacher, hey, I'd love to do marching band after school still. But I want to do I want to do theater classes in improv. Can I try that out? I'd have to drop band, but I'd love to do marching band afterwards. I still enjoyed playing the instrument. He told me no, hard no. If you want to be in marching band after school, you have to take band class. So I gave up. I gave up playing band and for my sophomore year of high school. And ever since then, I've never touched my saxophone since, which is a bummer. <laughs> um, so my music career kind of ended very early. But I I thought in terms of instruments. What is your favorite instrument to use? I would guess you would say piano, but I don't know. I wanted to put this question on the radar to see what your favorite m instrument is. It's definitely a a, pian a, a keyboard that's shaped like a piano. Uh, I, I have a love-hate thing with the piano, I think, but uh, I've really enjoyed over the last uh, you know 15 years of making ambient music, treating it like uh, a MIDI controller with 88 keys on it, basically. I, it kind of it can do anything I want it to at this point. I like that malleability. So I use it like a piano, and I can make it make piano sounds, you know. But uh, ultimately, I do a lot of kind of weird stuff with it, especially live. I do the whole show with a single 88 key keyboard. I don't have like a ton of different keyboards and buttons and stuff. And... I'm auto switching the instruments that I'm playing at any given moment and playing multiple instruments at once on different parts of the keyboard and make triggering video stuff. And you know, I'm doing all sorts of things with it. And so it's become just, I, I like buttons and uh, MIDI controller stuff that I can really custom, um, custom tune and program to do exactly what I want it to. So that's really my favorite instrument is more, Buttons and knobs, and the, the fact that this is you know shaped like a piano is comfortable to me. But uh, in terms of instruments, yeah, I wish I was a better guitar player. I, I I play guitar fine, but I'm not. I can't shred. I'm one of those like air guitarists. I'm hearing something, and I'm like basically playing rock band or guitar hero or something <laughs> in, uh, in the air or whatever. I'm big into rock band too for a long time. Uh, and yeah, I there's a bit of a. I wish I was a guitar god from the 90s. I wanted to be in a grunge band when I was a teenager. You know what I mean? Uh, that that dream's dead or whatever. But, <laughs> and I do really love playing drums. It's been a couple years. I, I don't have good opportunity to play drums in New York City in these tiny spots very often. But I played drums in a lot of bands before, uh, before this. And I, I do really like playing drums. But I don't use them on my, my ambient music. So nobody knows I play drums. 
and, and your music, let's dive into that because a lot of it is very, very different. Like some albums is very piano heavy and other, other mm-hmm. music that you have, it's, it's using different instruments and different kind of sounds and tunes. You can, you can tell I'm not a music master in terms of what, what words I can use, but I can just say up front, like I've said it many times on Instagram comments. Um, you know, even in Bandcamp, I've put a recommendation for your songs. Like your music is fantastic. It's, it's gotten me through a lot. And of course, I've used it in some of my videos, but I'm just curious, like when you're creating some of the albums that you've had, do you have any stories of either creating certain songs because a certain event took place in your life or, um, you know, I don't know, is there a music album that you've made that is really near and dear to your heart? I'm just curious to kind of uncover a bit more that maybe us as listeners don't know. Yeah, there's always something going on. They're all very personal to me whether it it could be heard or not and my songwriting before when i was singing and playing guitar and that kind of stuff always was and it got to the point where it's actually a little too personal i think and so i I liked having i like hiding behind the instrumental part and i didn't have to put english words into it and rhyme things and that kind of stuff but it is always coming from very personal places i do a lot of a kind of mental exploring of my childhood and um so every every record's kind of uniquely meaningful to me in one way or another. Some I like more than others. Some I hate more than others. <laughs> but um, we were talking earlier about moving up uh, before we started about moving up to Brooklyn. And um, I made this while you were asleep is, uh, I think, one of the uh, currently most um, personal records to me because I was here recording that record when I first met you in Bushwick. Oh, really? Yeah, I was. that's why I was up here. I had just lost my tech job of like seven, eight years. And this was just a few months before the pandemic hit. And I had nothing to do. <laughs> you know, I was unemployed. And I'm like, what am I going to do with my life? And I'm like, I'm going to New York City. I'm just, I need to go up to New York City. I'm going to go for two weeks. And I bought a Zoom recorder, a little surround sound Zoom recorder. I'm like, I'm going to go make some, I'm just going to go up there and make music. And so I rented a little Airbnb that turned out to be a block away from me right over here oh cool uh, in the exact same neighborhood and i stayed there for 12 days and just walked all over brooklyn and manhattan holding this little microphone with a dead cat on it so it's you know it's all furry and weird and i'm just i'm I'm just a total weirdo walking around but i I don't mind that because in new york city i'm never the weirdest thing you're gonna see all day (laughs) No matter how hard I try, it's <laughs> never going to be me. So it's like, it's fine. And yeah, I just recorded hours and hours and hours and hours of field recordings. Um, and yeah, then met you and then took that home and uh, finished it up, uh, the music over it and stuff. And I had no idea that it was going to end up being an audio document of my future, mm-hmm. of like it, I, I, where I was going. So then I made a record called... Uh, Bane of Babylon uh, during when COVID hit. That was kind of my, I didn't realize it at the time, but my goodbye to Orlando where I was living and to the theme parks. I'm a big Disney uh, theme park nerd for better or for worse in so many ways. And that was uh, both a goodbye and a fuck you to everything about Florida, (laughs) you know? Um, And those two records. And then the one after that too, Soft Rock Champion. Like I know these are all recent, but that was a way to take a bunch of old songs of mine. Those are all old songs with lyrics. Um, all the way back to like some of that stuff is from when I was 16 years old. I just take wow. a bunch of old stuff of mine and just kind of make it really good and pretty and then destroy it. <laughs> so no one would ever want to use it. Make, you know, I was just trying to like destroy my past. There's this little trilogy of stuff that is um, really very much about that transition from my old life in florida to my new one here um and so those are all really meaningful to me in their own ways but you know everything is people really like the piano stuff they like uh, you know undercover vampire policeman's probably my most popular one with most people and um that's just straight up me resolving childhood trauma <laughs> you know what i mean like just dealing with stuff whether you know it or not there's hints in the song titles i guess but yeah it's um, uh, yeah i I try to just i try to keep it really personal that's why i make this stuff i'm not trying to entertain anybody but myself the fact that anyone else hears it is means that i really like it you know i i think when 
creating art in any form, whether it's video, music, a show, creating an art piece, I think if you're just creating it for yourself, whether you're kind of going through something and that's the, the reason why you make it, or it's, hey, I'm making this because of a certain kind of person or who, whatever the kind of need is, I think that's the right motive to move forward with. It's like, I don't want to make this because I want a million subscribers. Like in all honesty, if I wanted to really grow on YouTube and do things, I would do things way differently if I wanted to really make oh, this yeah. like a full-time job. But there are <laughs> things that I would rather do and that just comes out of like my own passion, what I'm uh, you know, happy about and what I want to share with the world. And I think that's yeah. why people latch onto your music. Like it is true, it is genuine. It it and I've I've went on Bandcamp, you know, just a couple of days ago. Like people are going like this touches my soul. This song really puts me in such a comfort zone. And if I wanted to say one of my favorite albums that you made, I was going to say that I made this while you were asleep is one of my oh, favorites. Wow. Like keep up the momentum friend uh, beyond the editing door. Like there's so many uh, great oh, tracks yeah, on that. Door. And I heard like there's people walking around in the background. And I think like, how does he do this? Like, do, was he just like, I don't know, at a, a certain park or somewhere like wh where it, where in America or on planet Earth did he record these? So it's so cool that you uncovered that. Um, just a little background for people listening or watching. I only met Chris once uh, in 2019. He was visiting New York City. He had said on his Instagram that he was in Bushwick. I was living at Bushwick at the time. And I said, hey, huge fan. I'd love to just stop by and say hi. Do you have any time? And you were actually eating at a restaurant with one of your yeah, it was your at buddies. Yeah, fish place. What's the name of the fish place there? Exactly. <laughs> I stopped right by. I had a little bit of time yeah, yeah. after work, and I I just sat down, met you and your friend, and I talked to you about the kind of the music and how genius it is to just allow people to use it. And it was a good, a quick little half hour chat. Afterwards, I had to go. I think I had to travel somewhere the next day for work or something. Um, and then uh, I remember you saying you were moving to Germany. I, I like, yeah, well, you were, the, those plans were in the works. Yeah, it's it's something that uh, you know I left New York very quickly afterwards, and I think the only yeah. reason I would want to go back there, if I could teleport real quick, it would be to listen to your shows and then come back to cozy Germany <laughs> where I could you know be tucked away in my bed. <laughs> but it's and I want to also bring this up, like Chris, you're having shows, you're still doing stuff in New York. I think a great thing right. is to actually That's talk cool. about the next one that you're doing with a friend of yours. I think that'd be great to share. Yeah, I, I spent, once I started making ambient music, I stopped playing shows as much. Uh, you know, it's harder than used to get hard. Um, so it was a good eight years before uh, that I didn't really play my solo music live. And uh, starting to get back into it now. I've been playing more shows here in New York. And um, I mean, the one of the most recent record, Angie's Sunday Service, comes from a series of live shows. All of that music was written and improvised live and it turned into a record <laughs> a bunch of yoga music it was a really interesting project but uh this is a really special show so i was in a band let's see 2001 to 2002 my buddy dave and i they uh dave owen who i've known for over 30 years we are the best of friends in so many ways uh we started a band called struggle burger uh, in between college semesters uh, we were an instrumental, improvisational, noise rock grunge duo, I guess is maybe the best way to put it. And we never rehearsed. We never wrote anything. We just pushed record and played and had an album a few hours later. <laughs> just nice. kinda, we, we were wild. And that's all. that stuff's all over the place. Some of it's very drums and guitar and just being noisy. Some of it is completely abstract uh, noise. But we made a lot of music together. And then... Um, we played a small reunion show in 2004, but then that was the last time we have played music together in public. So he's coming out from Arizona, and we're going to have our first show together. We're doing two separate solo shows, but I think we probably will play at least one or two songs together in between. Uh, and we'll do a proper, proper Struggle Burger reunion one day for the hardcore fans, all, all two of them. But uh, it's it's going to be amazing because he his solo stuff is fantastic. He does wonderful guitar, live guitar looping and things, and creates these amazing soundscapes and so. Uh, yeah, but I'm still I feel like I'm still sort of in the beta test phase of my live show because it's a very multimedia experience. I'm I've spent over 20 years in video production as a uh, professionally, and it's only been in the last few years that I've gone full music for the most. Oh, you know, full yeah, pretty much almost full music. Still doing some video gigs at Karen occasionally, but I was a video editor more 
first and foremost. But in 2018, I got it in my head that I really wanted to make my own live visuals for a show. And that just led me down a path of learning a million different software things and spending way too much money. And so now I'm sort of a live visual designer for myself. And every show I do is different and I retool everything. And so this next show is going to be the probably, you know, the next closest thing to my, my, how I imagined the show being when I started this, you know, six years ago now, but we're almost out of beta. And so if this one goes really well, then, uh, it, you know, we're going to go on to bigger venues basically, but it's just in a small coffee shop, just a couple blocks from where I live free, very, very chill. You're there. You're not no tickets. That's, Show up. that's fantastic. Yeah. And I love the, the, the gamer language of we're in beta right now, you know, we'll go into soft oh, launch I... available. <laughs> <laughs> Lifelong video gamer for sure. Uh, yes, brings Twitch bring, is going in the background all day. <laughs> brings me, me. brings brings me into my next question because I do want to talk about how you've kind of gotten into making uh, visual kind of stuff for shows. But I, since we opened that can of worms with gaming, like what are yeah. your favorite video games that you either grew up playing or what you're playing right now? So I, had, you know, I got an NES for my you know, sixth, seventh birthday when I was a kid. Um, starting with that for sure, uh, Wolfenstein 3D and X-Wing, uh, that era of, uh, games back in the late eighties, early nineties were big for me. And yeah, I've never stopped playing video games. I currently, I'm a destiny one beta veteran. I have probably 3,500 hours across D1 and D2. Uh, I was playing destiny last night with my cousin, uh, in Portland, um, I used to be a big Hearthstone gamer for a while. I've d I did a couple tournaments, beat some pro players, did okay. You nice. Know, came in middle of the pack, but not bad. Um, and I was big into rock band, Guitar Hero, but especially rock band. I many thousands of dollars and hours into that, but that was that's professional development. Actually, <laughs> I learned a lot about music doing that. But oh uh, yeah, I've always been a gamer. I play lots of different games. Um, uh, yeah, uh, gaming's always been a big part of my what I do. So it's I've done a couple video game soundtracks and had some stuff in some pretty decent sized video games. Um, but making the, making the song for you was uh, the first time I had really dabbled into something that sounded like video game music, right? Like um, there's a game Her Story. Do you know about Her Story? That's like 2015. That's that's a bunch of piano stuff of mine, but it's from my uh, albums. You know, it's licensed. Ah, okay, gotcha. Um, and that's just piano stuff. This was this was fun because you you gave me the brief of just like I'm looking for something like Undertale. And you know, my kid was huge into Undertale. I'm like, okay, I know all about Undertale. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I got my hands on some sample packs of well, not just sample packs, but like synthesizers that emulated the actual Super Nintendo and Genesis like sound chips. And um, started playing with that for your stuff and that was really fun so now i think i think the next recording i don't know i think i'm giving up on the on an album uh because it's been like a year now but i've got about five four or five songs uh, including the one i made for you that i do like and that uh are mostly made with a lot of these video game sounds so i think the next ep and the next single which will actually probably be in the next month or so are very kind of video gamey and oh. weird in a way that I'm not I've never done before but I'm like I'm uh, I'm going to give it a shot and see what happens. Oh, I can't I well first off my, my pitter patter <laughs> my heart like video game stuff let's go. Uh, great that your your kids also into Undertale. I, it's a fabulous game that I I played back in the day. I had sure. I got like she was my, obsessed. I know I, I've never actually played it myself, but I, I know all about it. It <laughs> is a very, it, like people. If it's either you love that game where you're like Undertale, like how do you spell that kind of thing? I got to ask this side question: What class do you play in Destiny? Like, are you? Uh, oh, I'm I, I'm a three character main. I, I I do everything, but I I haven't been playing quite as much. The game's kind of in a, a bit of a lull here over the last six months. So I barely until actually yesterday. I'd been like full hunter, just I've not okay. even changed my, I'm just strand hunter, throwing Roombas everywhere, just like, uh, and I just logged in on Titan and Warlock yesterday to just like do some dungeon stuff, so 
Nice. Uh, okay. I, I leaned Hunter. I definitely a lot of Hunter, but I am I, I keep I've always kept them all up to date and yeah, I'm a, I made all three. There we go. Bungie's going to quote that or uh, you know, I actually be... looked yeah, the last time I looked at time wasted on destiny.com where you can it'll show you exactly how much you played. Doesn't even count being in orbit or the tower. <laughs> and it's pre it's pretty even. It's like you know, okay. 900 something hours for the hunter, 800 something hours for the warlock, 700 something hours for the titan. I'm like, okay, that sounds about that sounds about right. Yeah. Nice. Oh, cool. Long. That's awesome. Yeah, I, I played a. I when Destiny came out, I, I grabbed Hunter and I, you know, Destiny two came out, Hunter as well. Um, I played a little bit of Warlock too because they came out with certain skins you can only use for certain uh, well, classes. There's Warlock sick. Yeah. Uh, I'm like, <laughs> oh, I, I want some robes, so you know, I want to look like some cool <laughs> wizard. Uh, but yeah. let, let's jump back to what you kind of said: video game kind of music that kind of uh, might be on. It maybe in in a month or so we'll see it kind of published yeah, on your side. I think I might drop out an EP. I, I've never done an EP, and I've actually never released a single of my music just like a song by itself i'm always albums so just like here's a full album i'm done um but i got a few songs that i'm like these don't belong anywhere and i, I kind of don't want to flesh this out into something longer but i've got a couple little weird boppy kind of things here and maybe i'll just yeah i'll put these together so i might, cool. might be doing an ep pretty soon i'm working on a music video for one of them so we'll see that's awesome i mean like video came kind of music synthesizers and you know i'm, I'm huge into um, like synthwave music has been a big kind of trend sure. as of the last couple of years. So, uh, you know, I put the song you made into um, a bunch of other synthwave music from other people that I worked with, and they made some some great tracks as well. But it was really cool to receive your song. I, I think I sent you a message on Instagram. Are you down to kind of do this? Um, I heard it and I was like, oh my gosh, I got to share this to everyone close in my, my network. Like I called my dad and I was like, listen to this song and I want to hear your reaction. And he was like, who made this song for you? It is incredible. <laughs> and I told them all about you that day. And he, I even talked to him on the weekend. I was like, hey, you know, I'm going to be talking to Chris this weekend. He goes, oh, I, I'm making a lot of YouTube content. Can I use this song? So I was like, yeah, no problem. Like, here's how you do it. He's like, I'm going to buy every single album that he has on Bandcamp this weekend. I'm like, cool, go for it. There's a lot of different music. So I think just having more tracks on there just allows people to, you know, maybe you'll draw over to that that uh, gamer audience as well. Who knows, maybe Destiny content that you watch on YouTube or Twitch, like they'll be using oh, your tracks. <laughs> I run into my own music all the time. I am a bit, I, I watch more YouTube and Twitch than anything else. And I, it never fails to make me laugh out loud. I, even during the most inappropriate times, uh, I'll be watching something, somebody's being all heartfelt. And all of a sudden I fucking start playing piano in the background. I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> 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 well, I think I think that's a good transition over to the music that you do make. You have a lot of cool artwork, and you even say it said mm -hmm. Abaddon uh, Babylon has you know Epcot in the background for the the artwork yeah. that you have, um, and a lot of them they also have photos of you. I, it would be great to kind of uncover, and I think I'm going to ask this question on behalf of my girlfriend because yeah. she she's an art therapist, so she, her job is working oh, with okay. patients yeah. with art to uncover you know, maybe hard feelings or kind of like bring up topics that only the person who creates the drawing can really talk about. Let's dive deeper into what She's kind of album. Already. This yeah, is what's happening. There <laughs> we go. She's actually right here. No, I'm teasing. <laughs> I just want to figure out like a little bit more about the album art that you created. Like, tell us a little bit more about it. Do you have any hidden stories about some of the album art that maybe we don't know? Sure. There's a couple that I get a lot of questions about, uh, actually, that I, I never answer, but I'll answer for you. There we go. Um, I never respond to those questions. Uh, there's a good number of my records that uh, the artwork's been done by another very close friend of mine, Patrick Scott Bell. He's an incredible visual artist and photographer. He's running the New York City Half Marathon as we speak. Good luck, Patrick. I'm sorry I'm not yelling at you from the sidelines, but... <laughs> I wasn't getting up at five in the morning. Sorry. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. We've been working together forever. I've known him since he was uh, 11 years old and uh, we, uh, we've we been working together for a long time. So a lot of those are um, photographs that he made, like uh, the direct to video, for example, album cover that looks like a star exploding or something like that. That's a photograph. It's like wax on black paper like inverted it's very simple but really effective and cylinders is the same way that's also a photograph it looks like it's ai art or something like that but it's uh it's a photograph of like soap and different types of soap bubbles in different colors pressed into glass and 
do some really cool stuff like that. So he's definitely done a lot of that. But sometimes I have, and those are usually when I'm like, I, I don't know how to visualize this right now. I, I don't want to do my own album cover. But there are a few that are from old VHS tapes of mine. And these play into my live shows and my live visuals. There's actually quite a bit of, quite a lot of home movie stuff uh, that I use visually from my childhood. Um, I'm the keeper of a lot of VHS tapes from my childhood. <laughs> so I've used some of that. So the one I get the most questions about is it's a wonderful Jaws. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if you know the album cover. It's incredibly yep. bizarre, uh, <laughs> disturbing, but that is, that is a whole movie. My dad shot that with really a, uh, VHS camera. Yeah. And I am just off camera. Are you like, I'm in the room of that picture, but I'm not on, on the camera. And so it's, um, I don't know. You could probably show it. It's a, uh, it's hard to describe. Um, I know exactly what it is, but it baffles uh, most other people. But I, I'll tell you what it is. It's um, it's my mother and my sister. Okay. Um, and my sister's hanging upside down. My sister is born uh, brain injured, uh, severely brain injured. Angelman syndrome It's kind of a one in a million genetic thing. And uh, when she was very young, did a lot of, not a lot, I mean, 18 hours a day for three, you know, two, three years straight of physical therapy and um learning yeah uh, i mean like flashing flashcards and like read this what how, what number is this what state is this what bird is this mm -hmm. kind of stuff even though she can't speak just trying to teach her so part of that was there was a lot of they look like torture devices where we strap her into a with a bunch of velcro things to a, this big plank of wood on the wall and then just like spin her around and hang her upside down and spin her around it was all to get her you know uh, motor skills, her brain's motor skills in line to learn how to walk. And we taught her, you know, she learned how to walk. It's cra It's actually, a, that wow. whole thing's a very crazy story. So, um, but that is, yeah, from one of my VHS tapes. And it's a, it's just such a bizarre, weird image, but it also has incredibly deep meaning for me. So mm -hmm. I get to confuse people and also be like, not abstract at all, yeah. <laughs> really, <laughs> in my spare time. And there's another one, I think Divider is another VHS tape that's me and my sister. Okay. A little bit older than that, uh, as we're told that to put our shoes on because we're about to fly to Disneyland. Uh, so how sweet. <laughs> there's, there's, yeah, there's some things like that going on in there, but there's a few other little, you know, things I've made on my own. But I do try to find the right image. And uh, you, you mentioned Babylon and Epcot. Yeah, that was all. I, I, I had a feeling I was I was leaving Florida, even though I didn't know. And I went to Disney World. I went to Epcot with my high eight video camera my little analog thing um right after like a week after they reopened from covid oh, wow uh, okay. shut down right and disney never shuts down right yeah waffle house they say waffle house is the harbinger of hurricanes in florida <laughs> it's like no you have to really be worried if disney's closed something is yeah. really <laughs> fucked up and i went and it was ju i just shot hours and hours of footage and it was just the most dystopian fucked up place i'd ever been because i grew up going there and loved it and i'm there as an adult after covid and i'm like nothing i loved about this place still exists it's all it was like mostly under construction at the time it was all falling apart everybody's wearing masks everybody's staying really far away from each other and there's these constant uh public service announcements on the loudspeakers like please stay six feet away please don't forget to wipe your hands down after riding a ride and you're just like this is a totally different wow. place than i grew up at and it was just it, it was my last little look into that stuff so i shot a little kind of movie for that and that's where that album cover comes from because it's yeah that that record is very specifically about orlando and theme parks and kind of throwing away Throwing away your past, the <laughs> accepting that things will never be the same again, basically. Yeah, I, I know that there's a lot of importance when it comes to album covers, so it's kind of nice to get the background and, and history behind it. Like, I saw that album cover for It's a Wonderful Jaws, and I was like, there's got to be some random story here that, you know, oh, there's yeah. no way he just looked on Google and goes, yeah, that's bizarre. Like, let's take that one, you know? <laughs> so I knew, and then I saw the Dividers one. I'm like... He, this has to be him as a kid, like a VHS tape. Shout out to your parents, though, for kind of like still hanging on to him. My, my father did the same thing. He has a lot of the VHS stuff that he's now kind of compiled onto like a private uh, YouTube video that mm -hmm. I'll probably use in the future. And I've used it for yep. some of my outros of me getting excited about video games or whatever kind of thing. So uh, it's very cool. And, you know, the quality of that kind of footage, too. There's something very 
Oh. Very nostalgic yeah. and, and, and comforting. I don't, I don't know what it is. It's very. It's, I'm an analog guy. I love analog video, and I have uh, up here off camera. I have a bunch of different, basically guitar distortion pedals, but for video, for analog video. And so a lot of the, all this glitching stuff I'm doing, like in with hardware, no After Effects, and I love that aesthetic. There's something so, very. That's where I started learning video production. You know, and um, I also like my going back to my sister. Um, she's brain injured and would spend a lot of time watching movies and uh, TV, but not really TV, like tapes, movies. They'd, her favorite movie is Mary Poppins, and I, I think conservatively, I have seen Mary Poppins a thousand times, probably, honest to God, start to finish. Uh, that was just playing on loop in the background. It's just, it lives rent free in my head, whether I like it or not. <laughs> um, but she would, so she'd watch, you know, Disney stuff and um, listen to a lot of the, like soft rock radio. Grew up with a lot of that stuff in the house. But also watched these home movies that she liked nothing more than watching old tapes of us doing stuff and uh, people she knew and that kind of stuff. So these home movies, um, just on loop in my house uh, growing up. And so they were, yeah, they're always, that's one of the reasons they, they stuck around. They got kept in archives. Now I, I stole them all and I've archived them. And now I, I mine them for gold for my live shows and for music <laughs> videos and things when it's, when it's the right time. But it, yeah, I, I think it's, it's super cool though, that there is, you know, it's not just random, you know, oh, I filmed this and maybe you add the, the effects on it. Well, of course you can do that, but it's so cool that you bring stuff out from your childhood that was filmed back in a time where it wasn't meant for for stage usage or for for art in that sense. And there's something very charming and, and very, I, I can't come up with a word for it, but it's just like so cool that you can bring that element. It is like being vulnerable and sharing that side kind of thing. And we as people who get to see it can piece together and kind of think in our heads, you know, like with the music and the visuals and, you know, we can kind of piece together our own kind of story and narrative. But at the end of the day, you're the one that kind of has everything kind of together. And I think this is a good mm -hmm. kind of segue to the visual side of things. Like, you make fantastic music, but also there's a lot of really cool visual effect work that you do on Instagram. I think uh, either last year, or, or, I forget when, but you have a video of you playing music in that room and you have stuff mm, kind of yeah. broadcasted on the background. Tell us yeah, a little bit more about that's what the live show looks like. That's kind of like practicing for the live show. So you're looking at live visuals for that stuff. Yeah. How long does it take you to make these kind of visuals in the background? Like, is this something you can bust out in an afternoon or is this something you kind mm -hmm. of spread across a whole month? No, I, I, uh, I think less about uh, visuals for individual songs than I do. I, I look at a live show like an album, you know, like I'm very big on the order these things are getting played in and then the order that they're getting played in affects visually what's going to happen. Um, so... Uh, I mean, it can come together relatively quickly. Sometimes it's just a simple editing job. Like, um, I, yeah, I think your Air Hockey Saloon uh, was one that I did with some visuals here in the background to test it out. And that's relatively simple because it's a rhythmic piece that I'm not really improvising any of the structure of. That's easy to edit something too. So I, I do a bunch of glitching and then I go through and edit. And I'm a pretty quick video editor, generally speaking. Um, so sometimes that stuff comes together, but, um, man, sometimes it's a lot. Sometimes I get very ambitious. So, uh, there's so many permutations, so many things I can connect together to do different things. And I, I just, as long as I've got a focus, as long as I know conceptually why I'm trying to do what I'm trying to do, it's not, it's never just like random abstractness, though I like it to look and feel that way. It's got to come from a specific place for me. So... Um, it does take a while. That's one of the reasons I don't play live a ton, because I'm just totally refreshing the show. I want it to be very, very different every time. But there are a couple songs, though, I think, the you know, some of that footage might kind of stick around as its thing. I mean, like, um, I have a bunch of Disneyland footage, right? The, uh, going to Disneyland as an eight-year-old, and that was life life-altering trip. Um, and last show I did, I closed with... Uh, the first song on Thoughtless, uh, Everybody's Got Problems That Aren't Mine. I don't know. You know hey. uh, closed with that and was playing this Disneyland footage behind it and l looked up at the end and there were just a bunch of people just bawling, <laughs> just crying. I'm like, what's wrong? <laughs> like, no, I, I, I have these same sort of videos that I haven't seen in forever of my family going to a theme. I have like these theme park memories of going to the place with my family and uh, and friends and I just like it brought back so many 
it was so nostalgic. It brought back all these memories, even though it's my family and not, you know, not theirs. Um, that stuff just hits. Yeah. That stuff just works. Like, it's mm -hmm. fascinating. Like, you know, I'm the only guy with this footage. Like, that stuff, even at its most mundane, is so unique, right? It's so, uh, it can be so impactful. So, uh, I do really enjoy leaning into that. But, yeah, it's, it's, I don't know. I hem and haw. It takes a while. Well, it doesn't get thrown together. But I do, when I do visuals for other folks sometimes, a good friend of mine is a DJ and uh, I work with the New York Modular Society up here occasionally, doing live visuals, doing analogs, glitchy kind of stuff. That stuff's 100% improvised. Like, I don't plan for those shows at all. I, I get all the footage together I might want to use, and then I'm off to the races. I'm, I'm the sixth member yeah. of the band, you know what I mean? I'm performing. <laughs> but when it comes to my own stuff, it, it's a totally different totally different ball game. So that stuff gets much more highly edited and produced. Well, I think it's just wonderful that you have talent in making music and doing, you know, the video side of things. Most of the time people are like, Hey, I excel at one skill and that's kind of it. Like I'm an expert at playing guitar or kind of like mixing music, but the video side of things are like, what, what do I put in the background? Like a Microsoft PowerPoint. I, I really don't know what, <laughs> what, what can I got, you know, what, what do I do? So it's so cool that you've experimented with both these kind of forms of, uh, of media, which is fantastic. I think a lot of people, as you yeah. mentioned, when they're, listening to your show or even at home when they're listening to your albums, I think some people go, I want to make music. Like this is something that I want to do. Would you have any advice to people who are creating music in 2024 or even, I don't know, five years in the future, whoever's listening to this in the future, like what would you recommend to them or what kind of advice would you kind of give them? Um, well, number one, there's, there's no rules and not to take any advice from anyone, including myself. Um, I mean, I, you've got to know why I feel like it's, it is definitely enough to just want to fuck around on an instrument or learn a little guitar or whatever. And it's easier than ever to do that and learn anything you want to with YouTube uh, for free. You can, you can get good, you know, but, um, uh, I guess my recommendation would be to not worry about getting good or being good. I, I'm not a good piano player. I am not technically super amazing at any instrument really. Um, I mean, especially if you're talking about something electronic, like get a light version of Ableton and just start learning and start messing around. But just keep in mind that there are absolutely no rules at all. And if it sounds good to you and you like it, that's all that matters. Don't get too deep into like mixing and stuff. Don't worry about the songwriting. Just make stuff. And then the next thing you make is going to be better than the last thing. And you just keep moving. Don't don't compare your shit to other people's shit. You know, don't don't listen to radio and be like, oh, I'll never be that good. And it's like, no, <laughs> boo, who fucking cares? It doesn't matter. Just keep making things. Um, but yeah, in terms of learning, you can learn anything you want to. But in terms of breaking the rules, I feel like we're in a golden era for having the, the software, <laughs> the technology to destroy and break and rethink and just totally, yeah, follow, follow your heart. Do what sounds interesting to you. But just do your own thing. And with a lot of different musicians that are out there, you know, I'm, I'm someone that it's so ironic, but you show up in my top five Spotify artists the past three years. But I'm also a huge fan of like Tame Impala. I love listening to the Beatles every now and then. Um, like my my grandma's huge on Elvis. So, you know, I've heard Elvis tracks as well. There's a lot the of these are my favorite band. Just oh, to really? Be clear. Yeah, that's a that's a poster over there for their my favorite movie of all time had written by them and jack nicholson oh yeah, cool i'm i'm a monkey's uber nerd you, you wouldn't know i don't listen to a lot of ambient music i really don't i hear people asking like what's some good ambient music i have no fucking clue <laughs> I, I really, there's a few records i like and there's some artists i like but i'm an early electronic music guy like current ambient stuff i i have absolutely no idea i could not care less i'm a very rockish metalhead psychedelic rock like kind of guy and my influences like one of my records i think it's uh, thoughtless yeah is i hear it and i'm like this is my mashuga record you no one else <laughs> can hear this but this is swedish death metal this is what i was most influenced by at the time i i knew exactly what i was doing there you know so my influences don't come from quiet music generally <laughs> speaking anyway yeah I'm, but uh, the monkeys are my favorite any other <laughs> 
musicians or artists that come to mind that are also like in your, I guess, handful of favorites that you've either grew up listening to or you still listen to to this day? That was my question and you, you followed up with a great answer, but I'm also curious if you have oh, any yeah. other artists. Yeah, like, uh, so yeah, grew up uh, very religious and mostly li heard a lot of like church music and a little bit of pop music, but mostly a lot of soft rock and stuff. And it wasn't until my teenage years that I discovered rock and roll. And that was Queen, Pink Floyd, and Yes were my holy trinity when I first really got into music and still love all those bands dearly. Um, but it wasn't until I discovered Radiohead, honestly, when OK Computer is one of the first records I bought, like, you know, with my own money, went out to the mall, spent too much money on Sam Goody, you know, <laughs> <laughs> Capitol Records or whatever. And that shit completely changed my life. And so any anything Tom and company do, I, I am... I am a huge fan. I'm very, very obsessive, and that's that's they've been remarkably influential in so many ways. Really, not just in musically. That that stuff has changed the way I looked at the world, and you know, it really changed my life. So, I admit to being a, a massive Radiohead nerd, but I'm just a massive music nerd across the board. There's so much I love. I, uh, I guess right right before the pandemic, I I'd always loved reggae and dub reggae, but I went on the deepest of deep dives into 70s and 80s dub and like that's mostly what i listen to <laughs> in the background you know what i mean like huge scientist king tubby kind of guy and uh i'm kind of all over the place i like i just like good music but so, um sounds but radiohead like, um, like that that was a, a, a pivotal 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 point in my life that that shit hit so is there yeah. a music genre you don't favor like you're not a fan of listening to a specific genre i i you know i like everything but yeah it's cliche but modern country just drives <laughs> me up a wall my dad was a, a dj at a salt lake city radio country radio station when i was a kid i remember going with him and that, that era of stuff i'm like okay i can get behind and i like old country uh but man the new the, what is going on? It's just <laughs> the new stuff is insane. It's so bad. It's so bad. I was listening to, you know, the dude from Stained, Aaron Lewis from Stained, okay. right? Oh my God. I hate, I, okay. I hate the new metal era too, right? Because I grew up a 90s alt rocker yep. and grunge rocker. That was my high school. And new metal came in and destroyed everything and got all, oh, I hate all, I hate that Stained. I hate all that era of, of new metal stuff. I hate it. Um, <laughs> But I was listening to his country music. <laughs> he's, he's got a song called Let's Go Fishing. <laughs> that is exactly what you think it is. Yeah. I'm like, oh my God, this combines everything I hate about music all together. <laughs> we get stained and shitty <laughs> pandering country music, you know, about getting drunk and stuff. And you're like, oh my God. It, it, we, so we're... yeah, I, you won't catch me listening too much to that. Unfortunately, it's just not, you know. Yeah, the last thing, the last thing you can find Chris doing is playing Destiny while listening to country music. You would never see that happening. <laughs> let's bring, let's bring it a little bit more modern then. Okay, <laughs> let's let's take it, uh, let's get away from the countryside of things and get more towards the city side of things. You've been living uh, in New York for uh, uh, four years now, three years now. Almost is that correct? three, almost three. Yeah, I came up summer of twenty twenty one. Do you have any like cool spots and locations that you want to? publicly share like oh this is my favorite a cafe i'd love to go walk in this park um maybe you have a, a certain street i don't know that you like the ambience of I'm, I'm just curious like what's been your feelings with new york and do you have any cool places or spots you want to share with us man i almost don't want to share my favorite spot because it was so fucking crowded the other night i was there but it's become like a destination bar people are coming from out of them oh no I don't know what the fucking like Michael Stipe was drinking there for a while. I'm like, what the fuck is going on in here, man? Like, <laughs> this is my little is, but there's a bar. I, I'm 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 in Bed Stuy, and there's a bar just a couple blocks from me called Glorietta Baldy, that has been a to the only reason I'm still alive. I've met the most amazing people at this bar, the most amazing regulars. I don't even drink. I like, I just I like hanging out. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm not a drinker. I've made so many good friends there, and it's not uh, definitely not like other bars in so many ways. It's a different vibe, and people who come around regularly go like, "Yeah, this is not like normal bars." And the the folks uh, bartending there are incredible DJs. I'm constantly shazamming. I'm constantly hearing some of my favorite music ever. You know, Thomas, who's uh, also DJs under the name Six Psych World, 
got a DJ duo, vinyl only psychedelic and world music. Wow. Uh, that he DJs all around town and he's bartender there. And so he, his Spotify is uh, insane. Just, uh, just amazing. Uh, so it's, it's a wonderful place to hang out. That's my favorite bar to go hang out at. Um, in my neighborhood. Uh, I really like taking long walks. Uh, and that's the, what I, I didn't know it when I made it, but you know, uh, asleep. I made this while you were asleep. Is I am in motion that entire album. That none of that is stationary. I am walking, and that's usually what you can find me doing if I'm not home. Is is just sort of walking, wandering, walking from here to the World Trade Center across the Brooklyn Bridge, taking a long walk, whenever the weather's nice. Walking around Prospect, which is also in on that album. Um, and let's see. I yeah I've also I've I love the museums here I I do I still do a little bit of uh, freelance video work but it's not I used to be in post production and production now I'm in live events and so I'm setting up a lot of projectors and running cables and doing a lot of for big big corporate events and all sorts of crazy stuff at big venues so I've been spending over the last year a lot of time at like the Na Museum of Natural History oh cool. And the MoMA and the Met and the 9-11 Museum is unbelievable. It's I've, unbelievable. I've never been inside of it, so been. tell me about it. Most people around here have not been, I've, I've found, because they, uh, they're they like, oh, that sounds really dark and, and horrible. And you're like, fuck yeah, yeah it is. But it's it, there's no place in the world like it. There's I've never been to a museum quite like it where like this is de this is a museum to something that happened right here. Yeah, it's hard it's hard to describe until you get into it the sense of scale. But you're basically downstairs, and you can walk around the entire perimeter of what used to be the you know the wow. bottom of the building, and that's where the museum's in. But they've got you know giant columns of steel that are just bent, and it's like it becomes brutalist like, yeah. artwork and. Oh, amazing. So I've been uh, I've been spending a lot of time at a lot of museums over the last couple of years doing a lot of video work. And God, I love all these places. It's amazing the amount of culture out here. And then you add to it that you can see any band in the world that go, ever goes on yep. tour. Plus, amazing local bands. Shout out to my to Couch Slut, my favorite uh, local band. If you have not heard Couch Slut, they're putting out a new record soon. And they are easily the greatest band in New York City right now. Un unbelievable experience. I preach the gospel of couch slut. I've converted many. <laughs> um, and movies. I love movies. And so, like, there's amazing movie houses here. You can there's you can go see you know, ten different thirty five millimeter prints of old movies for you to choose from every day. You know. Mm -hmm. So I, I think I love New York as a as a, 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 in its entirety. All the, all of the art and culture. There's just so many amazing places to go. So I it think is. Those are my. Uh, New York, but you can New usually find me at Gloria de Baldi. There, Not there it is. With the drinker. Just, you can usually find me chilling. That's kind of my, my living room when I want to go hang out with friends. So. The, New York in general is incredible. And it's cool that you even shared spots that you attend. So maybe, I don't know, if people are yeah. listening to this, like you might, may oh, bump into Chris oh, around. Oh, you know, maybe he's walking the Brooklyn Bridge on his way to the 9-11 Memorial. The Memorial itself is also super powerful. Like it's, it is one of the really cool oh. spots to be at. And there's a lot of just feelings and 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 just like the memorial they made it so beautiful and it's a very cool place to walk through 100 percent recommend uh, when i was living in new york that was also a place that i'd love to go to and just kind of uh be around there it's a, it's a different vibe and feeling of course with what happened uh, but so many amazing places in new york great music too everywhere every big musician even the small ones like You'd spend oh, yeah. too much money living in New York, really. Like, oh, I live in a shoebox apartment. <laughs> but, yes. uh, you know, it's like what you give up to be there is something that uh, um, is it, it, it does pay for itself in some aspects. One of the biggest things I will say is when I was living in New York, the biggest thing that I missed was like trees. I was in Bushwick. So, you know, there's a couple of smaller sure. parks out there. But at one point I was like, oh, my goodness, like I just want to be in a forest for like three hours where I don't hear cars or horns or people going, I'm walking here. Well, OK, you know, it's more it's more people playing loud music or whatever in, in Bushwick. But um, I, I loved my time in, in New York. I had a great time there. And I spent a lot of time on top of my rooftop. It was like mm -hmm. a access rooftop there where everyone in the apartment could go to on that rooftop. Like, Chris, I'm playing your music up there on a Bluetooth speaker that I bought for 40 bucks. Like I've had great times there looking at the, the one world trade center in Manhattan. Like 
It was a very cool time when I was living in New York. So thanks for kind of sharing uh, your your secret spots and uh, where you like thanks to go. You. Yeah. I think a final question that I kind of want to wrap this up with, because it's about an hour. It's a good amount of time for people on their lunch break or, I don't know, on their second monitor mm-hmm. to have content. You said you're not a drinker, which is awesome. I don't drink alcohol myself. But what, what do you sure. like to typically drink? Like you're a coffee drinker. I've heard this. You're probably sipping on one right now. But what are some other drinks that you like to uh, consume? Uh, I'll make it brief, but I have a long uh, sorted history with all sorts of drinks and substances because I was raised Mormon. So coffee was verboten and alcohol, you know, sugar was the only drug. <laughs> so I, I, I got very big. I've lost quite a bit of weight since uh, my 20s. But uh, the sugar was the drug. Um, then I got the fuck out of Mormonism and started trying all sorts of drinks and drugs and, <laughs> and all sorts of stuff. <laughs> And it's been quite a journey, uh, but alcohol has just, I, I, I've had plenty of alcohol in my time, but it's just never really been my favorite thing. And when I moved up here, it was my intention to like, just not drink. And I never have alcohol at home. It's just, it's, you know, I don't have a problem with it, but I don't, I just don't care most of the time. Really hard to go out in New York city and not drink. And I do love hanging out at bars, but I, so for the first, first couple of years here, I was drinking, not heavily, but still way too much. It's just still way too much for me. It's, it's hard to leave the house like that and not just get a glass of whiskey or a beer with somebody or whatever. And yeah, in the last couple months, um, my daughter was living here with me for oh, for a good six months after high school here. And she's now out in Portland going to school. And over the last couple of months, it's just I'm coming down from a lot of stress and a lot of anxiety. And I'm like, I just get just start treating myself better and that included the alcohol and so yeah it's been a over a month since i had any alcohol but really two like i wasn't really drinking much before that either um so it's not like super new but again it was something i never really cared about but i feel like a fucking million dollars not drinking anymore even just like one or two drinks like a little bit of whiskey a week or something i i don't miss it at all i don't miss it at all you know um, so I'm definitely on the sober train at the moment. And I feel amazing. Uh, and now, now it's just coffee. But coffee it was so stigmatized by Mormonism that it was the l- last drug I tried. I had done I had done everything else. I tried all the psychedelics and all the everything before before I was really ready to approach coffee. And now just like black coffee is get up, have some black coffee. You know, yeah. I'm like an intermittent faster kind of guy. So I just only eat dinner. So I'm just like water and coffee all day. And, that's good for me. I feel, you know, feels nice. It makes nice. Me productive, so. Awesome. It's so cool to lots hear that. Lots and lots of water, a little bit of coffee. There we go. <laughs> we got a hydrated gamer. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> and Always. It's, it's something that, you know, kind of being on the sober side of things, you, you really, it is easier said than done. I think social influence is a really hard thing to kind of oh, easier for some yeah. people to kind of sway away from it. Um, you know, some people will um, sway you into, oh, okay, you know, it's fine. But I think if you're with good friends and they don't care, judge you for what you do and what you don't do, like you're in the right group and you have the right kind of people to hang out with. So it's good to hear that you're uh, kind of on that Absolutely. sober side of things and, and staying healthy. Like, that's awesome. I'm a huge mineral water drinker. I, of course, tap mm-hmm. water is always on, on the house everywhere I go. But mineral water, it's been my new favorite thing in Germany that I, I can't stop. And I even asked my my doctor, my is it can I drink too much mineral water? Like, is there should I hold off? He's like, you're good. Like everything's fine. Like you know, obviously you need tap water every now and then, but you're good. Mm-hmm. So, uh, and I'll spice it up every now and then with a fresh cup of orange juice. That is my favorite. You know, sometimes Ooh. in the morning kind of thing. So my move at the bar is uh, seltzer water and bitters and a lime, and I'm set. And so, I know the bar's not making as much money on me as they used to, but. Uh, <laughs> I still tip incredibly well, so the bartenders love me, and that's all that matters. So they just they keep me hydrated all night. I there we go. And like, you can and you got can... ready for me, and it's like <laughs> cool. <laughs> and I feel great. I don't need the social lubrication either. I'm uh, I'm pretty chill to hang out with. So I've been loving not drinking, loving it. It's Some like, someone yeah. I didn't cl- have my first drink till I was like 25. I think. Okay. Like I did, this was just never really a thing for me. It was always social. But it became, I was too social out here and it became just too much. So I'm, I'm, I love, love just plain old water. There we go. Like to hear it. Yeah. Oh, awesome. Chris, what is the best way for someone to support you? Obviously, they can listen to your music on any of the platforms, but is there mm-hmm. a better way to support you? Maybe they um, have a couple of, of loose change in their pocket. Like, what's the best way someone can support you and your music? 
The best thing anybody can ever do is just tell people they love about me and tell people they hate to fuck off. You know, like, uh, just if you if you like it, share it, show it, show it to people, give it to people that, you, you know, recommend it. That's always the most pop, most important thing. If you're trying to support me financially, I mean, that's that's always nice. I'm doing pretty well on Spotify and I do. I have composing uh, stuff I do for money, too. I have, I have some major stuff coming up that I can't talk about yet. But it's, it's coming. <laughs> I have, I, have, I have big things uh, almost here. It keeps getting delayed, but it's coming soon. Um, but my next full score for st something. So I, I've got that kind of stuff going on in the background. And I don't like asking people for money, but my band camp, you can go and pay any amount that you want to with no minimum, no maximum. Um, and you get to keep, you know, high quality, the, the highest quality files available. But, you know, just have me on the background, especially, you know, in, including my music when it fits right into any art you're making or, you know, making art while you're listening to it or whatever. Like that's that's always incredible um, and goes a long way to just passing my stuff around. So it's it's all organic. It's all word of mouth. That's all I do. I've never bought any ads. I never will um, just let it spread naturally. And so that's that's the best thing you can do is not just listen, but like, you know, tell people about it or make something with it like that's that's always the best way to support me. perfect well I, th I think that's a good way to to kind of end things and i i've done that myself like i talked to my dad yesterday he's like where's his band camp at how do you spell his last name i'm gonna buy every <laughs> single album that he has so um you know my dad will be using your music in his future content so it was great perfect. to yeah great to chat with you chris thanks so much for spending uh, your time on on today's podcast uh if you have any Thank questions you. for chris i can't guarantee that he'll answer but leave your favorite album of his in the comments if you have a specific question for him let him know i'm sure i'll send this video over to him so he'll be able to have it on on his second monitor maybe while he's working on music who knows thanks again <laughs> chris um have a good rest of your day everyone and of course stay hydrated gamers i'll see you in the next one